Scratch a transphobe, find a racist. That's what they say. And today's scratch and sniff is none other than Stonewall Parasite, Fred Sargent. Now I've always known Fred Sargent as a major bigot on multiple fronts. Known, but never really been able to demonstrate quite as conclusively as I can now. For those who don't know, Fred Sargent is a white middle to upper class cis gay man who, with the help of his partner at the time, attempted to have the Stonewall Inn shut down. The Stonewall Inn, for those unfamiliar with its history, was the meeting place of many trans, working class, and queer people of colour. It was one of the few places they could go to in the area since many other gay bars had a policy of turning such people away or making them so uncomfortable that they left. This knowledge has been shared with us by people such as Stonewall veteran Miss Major Griffin Gracie, a black trans woman and regular patron of Stonewall who was inside the night it was raided before the revolution. Now I'm not trying to glorify the Stonewall Inn. It wasn't a wondrous place for your problems, but it was all many people had and it was certainly better than being isolated from the community. However, Fred and his then partner, Craig Rodwell, owned a bookshop, the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop, along the same street and viewed the inn as a scourge. In a leaflet they distributed following the uprising, both Fred and Craig called on people to petition the local government to crack down on the inn, something that would result in greater police presence, putting the people inside at increased risk of police brutality. Indeed, the problem seemed less about police presence, more that they weren't the right type of police in that they weren't going after the right people Fred and Craig wish they were. More on that in a moment. Only a few years after the uprising, Fred himself would go on to join the police force and climb to the rank of police lieutenant, all whilst doing absolutely nothing to help the community. They also called on gay businessmen to step forward and open bars to compete with the mob as if most gay people just had stacks of cash laying around, a move that really shows just how detached they were from the rest of the community. Not everyone had the money to move to New York and set up shop like them, certainly not the people who regularly attended Stonewall. Fact is, Stonewall attracted what Fred and Craig saw as an unhealthy or hellhole social atmosphere. What Fred might try to claim refer to the fact that the bar was mob run. However, they never seemed to apply the same principles to the mob run bars they attended. Because fun bit of information, Fred only visited the Stonewall Inn twice, at least according to his own testimony. When it came to the bars they attended, other forms of protest were used to improve their conditions. So Fred and Craig's desire to crack down on mob run bars only seemed to extend to those that cater to trans, working class, and queer people of colour, making it appear like they had issue with the sort of patron the bar attracted rather than with the people who ran the establishment, the implications of which, though not explicit, are pretty clear. They were seeking to gentrify the area, to make it meet their middle class sensitivities, and that included getting rid of the unhealthy social atmosphere. And Fred's contempt, not just for trans people, but people of colour, really shows in tweets like these, framing the Stonewall uprising as being predominantly led by cis white people, as opposed to black and Latino druggies in drag. By the way, many drag kings and queens at the time were trans people by today's definition, but referring to themselves as a drag actor was safer back then. Therefore it's them Fred is attacking the memory of here. Reminder, the police separated those trapped inside the Stonewall Inn into male and female lines, sexually assaulting them by exposing their genitals, and arresting anyone whose genitals didn't match their presentation. When several resisted said sexual assault, the police arrested everyone inside and started to drag them outside. The police weren't hunting gay people, they were hunting trans people. Also, just in case you're watching Fred, you cannot be racist to white people. Racism is systemic oppression, like what you rely on. There is no systemic oppression of white people. Oh, and turf isn't a slur, you racist piece of shit. Though it is a misnomer in the way that no fascist bootsucker, like yourself, should be considered anything 
remotely feminist. And it's amazing just how many white fascist bootsuckers are willing to applaud you as you throw around actual slurs like the N slur, the K slur, and the S slur so carefree. However, following the success of the Stonewall Uprising, which neither Fred nor Craig were involved in, having only seen part of it before walking away, they decided to insert themselves into the narrative, hijacking the momentum to serve their own wants and needs. Going so far as to support the exclusion of the very people who had instigated the riots. This appropriation is why Sylvia Rivera, a Latina trans woman, was forced to climb on stage and call this out, pointing at how the early Christopher Street Liberation Day rally, what would later become Pride, had been hijacked by a white, upper-class exclusionist group. I will not no longer put up with this shit. I have been beaten. I have had my nose broken. I have been thrown in jail. I have lost my job. I have lost my apartment for gay liberation. And you all treat me this way? What the fuck's wrong with you all? Think about that. If you all want to know about the people that are in jail, and do not forget Bambi Lamore and Dora Mark, Kenny Messner, and other gay people that are in jail, come and see the people at Starhouse on 12th Street on 640. East 12th Street, between B and C, apartment 14. The people that are trying to do something for all of us and not men and women that belong to a white middle class, white club. And that's what you all belong to. Revolution now! Give me a G! And this is an ideology Fred maintains to this day, in working with the LGB Alliance, a group mostly comprised of far-right cishet people that, among other things, seek to destroy LGBT plus education in schools. Indeed, Malcolm Clark, one of the organization's founders, went ahead and declared such programs dangerous because of, quote, predatory gay teachers, end quote, asserting that such LGBT plus inclusive lessons would go on to be, quote, unnecessary encouragement to predators, end quote. Also, not to forget, LGB Alliance is associated with various anti-abortion and anti-LGBT plus hate groups. Groups such as the Heritage Foundation, the Alliance Defending Freedom, and the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network. All far-right groups that routinely attack the rights of queer folk. This is the organization that Fred Sargent has decided to support with his free time. Why? Well, because it offers him, among other things, a platform where rampant transphobia and racism is met not with indifference, but applause. It should therefore perhaps come as no surprise to anyone that following the murder of Tony McDade, a black trans man who, according to multiple eyewitness testimonies, was gunned down by police unarmed and without warning, that Fred would go ahead and declare such atrocity as, quote, a good thing for all, end quote. Now there's a lot to unpack with this case, especially with the deliberate obscurification people like Fred are partaking in, claiming to know things that haven't been confirmed even now, that certainly weren't known by police at the time, and wouldn't justify what happened either way. And he largely seems to be getting away with it on one account. Tony McDade was human, not divine. But first, let's cover events as police saw them at the time. On May the 27th, 2020, at 10.45am, police responded to a call about a young man, Malik Jackson, who had been stabbed and would later die in hospital. It was noted that the suspect possibly had a gun as well as the knife they'd used to stab Malik. Now, McDade matched the suspect description and was spotted less than 15 minutes later. And here is where the police and eyewitness testimonies 
diverge. According to police, they got out of the patrol car and issued a warning, at which point McDade began to fire a gun. One of the officers fired back, wounding McDade in the process. McDade would later die in hospital. However, according to eyewitness testimony, this is far from the truth. Eyewitness Clifford Butler told the press that, quote, As soon as he pulled up, I seen him jump out of the car, swing the door open, and start shooting. End quote. They also added that, quote, I never heard, get down, freeze, I'm an officer. I never heard nothing. I just heard gunshots. End quote. This was also independently corroborated by live video posted to Facebook just after the shooting, in which the person recording, Kim Simmons, stated that police, quote, jumped right out of the car and started shooting, end quote, again stressing that they, quote, got out of the car blasting, end quote. Now the important thing to note about that video, which is linked in the referenced articles, is that it contains heavy misgendering. The people at the scene didn't know Tony, so there's a lot of back and forth of is he a man, isn't he? So be prepared for that if you watch. However, there is another important reason to note this fact, and that's the way in which since they didn't know Tony, they had no reason to lie. They weren't trying to whitewash the actions of a friend or a loved one, they saw police jump out of their car and shoot an unknown and unarmed black man. The police, meanwhile, have every reason to lie. Indeed, they are refusing to release body cam footage of the incident, something that all but confirms this as just another case of police brutality. And people might say that's a big assumption I'm making, but here's a fact. I don't have to assume the sun will rise in the morning because we've observed it happening enough times to build a pattern. The same is true of police brutality. Yet, even if we didn't have that pre-existing social context of the whole situation, the burden of proof rests on the person who resorted to lethal violence to justify said actions. It should also be noted that the officer who shot and killed Tony McDade hasn't been named and has only been placed on administrative leave. And both of these things, the refusal to release body cam footage and the refusal to name the person who seems to have murdered Tony McDade in cold blood, are problems the Tallahassee Community Action Committee, the American Civil Liberties Union of Florida, and the Human Rights Campaign have been very vocal about. From the evidence available to us, the police had zero justification for the usage of lethal force in this situation. There is absolutely no question as to that in any social context, let alone one with a history of racism. Tony was an unarmed suspect, shot without warning, deemed guilty by public speculation. So how do people like Fred Sargent think they're going to justify what took place? Well, as already mentioned, Tony was not a saint. As Anne Brannigan put it, quote, Tony McDade was an imperfect victim of police brutality. End quote. Tony had a police record and had been to jail. He was institutionalized in a for-profit prison system that tortures its victims with the consent of the general population. He was stuck in a system of abuse and violence in a world that hated his existence on two accounts. He was black and he was trans. After Tony's death, it came to light that he had been the victim of assault. This information comes to us from the Tallahassee Democrat, a news outlet that, like many others, chose to misgender Tony. Something to be aware of when reading or listening to various outlets talk about what happened. Now, according to the Democrat, there was a video posted somewhere which showed what appeared to be Tony being viciously assaulted by a group of men. Now, in response to this, Tony streamed his own video on Facebook, showing his wounds and discussing how what had happened to him had effectively killed him, how it left him feeling like he had nowhere to turn to and nothing to live for. So he may as well take as many of the people who assaulted him down with him. At one point, he predicted that the police would likely become involved and stated very plainly that he had no intention of going to prison. Again, the police had no knowledge of these videos, and we still don't know if Malik was one of the people who assaulted Tony. It could have been a very unfortunate coincidence. 
Or it could be the case that Tony is guilty or said stabbing. It's also possible that he started, only to realise that this was not the path he wanted to take as he saw the fear in his target's face. The point is, the police didn't know, and Tony didn't seem to have a weapon when he was shot by police without warning. So I need to be absolutely clear on the facts that even if Tony McDay does turn out to be the person responsible for the stabbing of Malik, that does not vindicate the police of their brutality in this atrocity. The police failed to even attempt to de-escalate the situation and bring Tony in. And because of that, Tony had his life taken from him. But there's more to the story, and that is the systemic failure of the police that resulted in the death of one, perhaps even two young men, if it turns out that McDade had stabbed Malik. If the justice system were working, if McDade had felt safe coming forward over his assault, then all of this could have been avoided, because that's a disgusting double standard behind what people like Fred Sargent say. They claim it's okay for a white officer to take the life of an unarmed queer black man in cold blood over suspected murder, but it's not okay for a queer black person to retaliate over a previous assault, an assault that made them feel powerless. McDay's possible violence vindicates the white police officer, whilst Malik's known violence, if indeed he was one of the people targeted by McDade over the previous assault, that only condemns McDade. Do you not see the double standard here? If Malik was McDade's target, it's a fucking tragedy that one black man died that day. Yet for two black men to die that day, one at the hand of a trigger-happy cop who just wanted to kill with impunity? That's an atrocity. And both deaths could have been avoided if the justice system actually worked. Because who was Tony supposed to turn to for help after he was assaulted? To trust? Even in death, both the police force and the general public continue to enact violence upon him in misgendering him, with police reports referring to him as female in spite of the fact that they acknowledge people knew him as a trans man. There's no peace for McDade, even in death. Or as Anne Brannigan put it, quote, This context is important to understanding McDay's mindset on May 27th. His choices were shaped by systemic violence long before a Tallahassee officer pulled up and pointed a weapon at him. It's worth noting that what we know about the TPD itself points towards deep systemic issues. McDay's killing was the third deadly police shooting in less than two months. The two most recent killings happening within eight days of each other. That this isn't a bigger story is indicative of just how routine these shootings actually are, nationwide. The frequency is an important piece of this puzzle, especially as misinformation clouds the circumstances of his fatal shooting. The first thing you'll notice in all of the reports of McDade's death is how much is obscured, largely by the police, but also in part by the local media that first reported his death. The veil around his death, misgendered, with no transparency about who killed him, is a form of violence too. If one dares to judge McDade for resorting to violence, one also needs to examine all the ways violence, anti-black, anti-trans, interpersonal, state-sanctioned or state-enabled, collided with his life." End quote. And this is something people like Fred Sargent are responsible for, because in spite of the lack of hard evidence that McDay was an immediate threat to the officer who killed him, in spite of the fact that he is still just a suspect in the murder of Malik Jackson, in spite of the fact that McDay was marginalised, alone, and in need of help, people like Fred Sargent declare people like Tony guilty without trial, and therefore justifiably murdered in his eyes, solely on account of the fact that Tony was black and trans. And yes, this is a hill I'm willing to die on, defending the human rights of a suspected murderer with a troubled history, because you know what? They call them human rights, not saint rights. They're an intrinsic part of a person, and the people we entrust with upholding justice, they should work to their fullest extent to protect 
said rights. Because if we start pretending like rights are only extended to those of us who are absolutely faultless, then none of us can really be said to deserve them since all of us have been complicit in systemic atrocity. This narrative that being a murder suspect forfeits your right to live will only be broadened and used by police to justify further killings, something that needs to be ended. Fred Sargent is proof that once a bastard, always a bastard, even when retired. To see him celebrate the tragic and unnecessary death of a queer black man, gloating about it in response to community action intended to raise awareness of said atrocity in the greater ongoing narrative, is truly sickening. Tony isn't the monster here, he's just one of many victims of systemic racism and systemic transphobia. The real monster here? Well that's Fred Sargent. Though you know what? Things don't have to be this way. There are city councils out there very openly looking for ways to disband police and replace them entirely with community-centered alternatives. These protests aren't simply bringing to light a real issue. They're pushing real change, not symbolic gestures, actual paradigm shifts. Though for some, these changes won't come soon enough. And in light of that, I'd ask you to consider supporting the Black Visions Collective, a black-led, queer-inclusive organization dedicated to black liberation via community means. By supporting them and similar organizations, hopefully we can achieve a world where the deaths of people like Tony McDade and Malik Jackson become a thing of the past. So please, give whatever you can now or perhaps bookmark the organization for future donations, as they won't resolve things overnight. They need constant and consistent aid to help achieve justice for the victims of police brutality and support for those marginalized in the black community. We can change the system, if we choose to. So with that said, we just like to thank our Patreon sponsors, giving a special thanks to the following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Sir Ryan Katie, Gareth Van Voorst, Chelsea Williams, Wellington Marcus, Steve Corbin, Sosh Daniels, Justin Allen, and Atlas 5. And for myself and Adita, take care now.